three Zimbabwean-born lawyers have filed a constitutional challenge against the Legal Practice Act, which states that they are unable to practice their profession because they are not permanent residents or citizens of South Africa. Now, Bruce Chaganyuka, Nyasha James Nyamugure, as well as Dennis Tatena Chadia, say they've all obtained the appropriate degrees, written the board exam, and completed their pupillage in, on the ongoing case before the Constitutional Court. They are also all in possession of various permits that allow them to live, study and work in South Africa. Now to tell us more uh, on this matter is Muchengeti Wacha, who is the Executive Director of Asylum Seeker, Refugee and Migrant Coalition. He joins us in the studio. A very good morning to you. Thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, uh, waking up so early on a Saturday morning. A, a very important matter. Can you just start by giving us a brief history on, on, and exactly what, uh, what the problem is. I think you summarize it quite well to say that uh, these individuals who have the right to live and work here, conferred upon them by the state, uh, are being denied the opportunity to pursue um, a, a career in the legal profession uh, based on what we deem are on constitutional grounds, um, this differentiation between permanent residents and persons who have the right to live and work here and are ordinarily resident here. Yeah, and that, that right was, was uh, conferred to them as, with a special permit, the Zimbabwean special permit, I believe. Uh, we know that uh, you know, the Department of Home Affairs are ending that, that permit as well. How, how much of an impact does this have on uh, the situation? So uh, two of the applicants indeed uh, are on this uh, special uh, permit. Uh, however, there is one who is on a, on a different permit, uh, so that allows him to be here more, more permanently. Um, however, that regime doesn't per preclude them from applying to other visas, and I'm sure they'll do so um, during the course of the uh, grace period that's been given by the state. So it is to some extent uh, some sort of an impediment, but uh, not... Uh, insurmountable. Mm. I mean, and, and what seems to also be an impediment is a, the fact that they tried to improve their lives and went on and studied law and wrote the board exam and, and ha have been qualified essentially to practice. Uh, however, permanent residency now seems to be a problem as a result of that as well. Exactly. I, uh, we think that uh, any state has the right to regulate its, its employment market, etc. However, uh, we're in a constitutional democracy and any limitation of rights must be constitutionally permissible. Um, we are of the opinion that uh, here the state has failed to proffer a proper constitutional justification uh, for limiting the rights of these individuals. Uh, what are some of those uh, uh, justifications that the state have uh, brought forward? So in our papers we uh, reach back to the inception of this uh, pro uh, prohibition and it seems to be stem, it seems to stem in a sort of a apartheid, uh, anti-black, uh, trying to keep uh, black legal practitioners out of the legal profession. That's where it stems from. Um, in contemporary South Africa, we think it has to do with issues of uh, employment. Um, however, the state sort of failed to show statistics as to how many people are affected. Uh, is this actually taking jobs? And uh, our opinion is actually no, uh, we don't think it is. Uh, it's actually limiting the diversity and uh, the contribution of non-citizens to the legal practice in this country. And I mean, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, being a, an attorney is not on the essential uh, skills list um, that are exempted from, uh, you know, well, you know what's happening currently yes, in yes. the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you make of that and do you think that that is justified? There has been a lot of back and forth with the Minister of Home Affairs, uh, as I understand it, uh, between the legal profession, whether they qualify as critical skills or not, uh, but ultimately the minister has decided to exclude uh, the practice of law from the critical skills list, and which is his prerogative to do so. Um, however, once the state has conferred the right to live and work in this country, uh, an unqualified right, I might add, mm. um, then where they want to seek to limit these people from pursuing a career in the legal profession, there needs to be good reason for that uh, in terms of our constitution. Uh, and I mean that's exactly what's happened. The state has conferred these people with the right to live and work in South Africa, but unfortunately now not seem, seemingly the right to, to practice. Uh, there was a, a hearing in the Con Court. You've taken it to uh, the Con Court. Uh, how did that go? It was on a Thursday, I believe? Yes, uh, on Thursday um, our matter was in the Constitutional Court. Uh, we were joined by a number of applicants from um, the Free State. Uh, as well as uh, some Congolese nationals who are on refugee permits, I believe. Um, we believe that the hearing went quite well. Uh, judgment will come out in a few months, I believe. Um, and essentially, we 
uh, made the points that we need to make, and uh, it's now in the court's hands. I mean, this is a, it would be a big judgment. It's a, it's a big case that you're taking on. It would uh, mean, you know, the, the, the changing of the Legal Practice Act as well and putting that on hold uh, for a couple of months. It will have to go through Parliament. Um, it's quite a large task that you're taking on. It is indeed. Um, it's been a lot of work that's been put in. And if you allow me the opportunity to um, just uh, commend our, our legal team, uh, Shikosi attorneys, um, they did quite well in uh, assisting us to, to bring this case to the fore, uh, as well as our, our, our counsel, who uh, I won't name, but they, they, they know them. I'd like to just uh, acknowledge them right now. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, back to, to uh, what happened on Thursday, um, obviously you can't speak too much on, on, on the proceedings there, but uh, did it seem like you were able to strike a tone with uh, the judges? They, they, you know, is it something that, that seems to be something that, that they are really considering? Look, we have uh, absolute faith in the judiciary, um, and uh, we believe that they understood the issues um, as well as understood uh, the uh, points of uh, our opponents. And ultimately, they'll decide whose uh, arguments can stand uh, constitutional scrutiny. Um, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. And the permanent residence, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a barrier, of course, a massive barrier that, that, that is the case. How would we work around it? How, how would the solution come about and how would it look? So what we've argued before the constitutional court is uh, there are persons who, for one, can live and work in the country. Uh, for two, they are ordinarily resident here. Uh, we feel like those two factors um, are akin to people who are permanent residents. So the relief that we would like the court to craft would be along those lines. Be like individuals who, one, have the right to live and work, and secondly, um, have ordinary residents in the country. That should be sufficient for them to, to practice in the country. So that's the manner in which we, we'd like the relief to be crafted. Mm, how much of, of you know, international practice are you, are you looking at as well? I mean, this uh, generally isn't something that, that happens in any other country. You generally go to another country, you write the bar exam there, you pass, and you get admitted into the role. What we've looked at is a number of comparable jurisdictions, uh, including in SADC. And what we find is um, ordinary residence is the qualifying criteria. To be like, are you a person who is uh, present in the republic for a, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Um, that should be a sufficient bar. Permanent residence uh, is a, a, an additional hurdle which we feel is, is not constitutionally permissible. Um, so I think uh, we just hope that uh, the court is cognizant of uh, the general practice um, we believe uh, in these comparable jurisdictions. Mm. Uh, and for somebody who might not be uh, uh, too in tune with, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between like, an ordinary resident mm. and a permanent resident, can mm. you just highlight the differences for us? It's generally a legal status. So the Immigration Act uh, confers upon non-citizens various statuses. Um, one would be, for example, a study permit uh, or a spousal permit, mm. uh, and then the other level is permanent residence. Uh, so permanent residents, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, have been admitted into the Republic permanently and um, have a myriad of rights under the Constitution, excluding those that apply to citizenship, so, for example, voting, um, those, those type of rights. Mm. Um, so, essentially, it's a very difficult status in which to attain. Uh, it's not something that one can achieve overnight, and some of our applicants have um, made various efforts to obtain permanent residence, um, but were frustrated by uh, various processes uh, within the Department of Home Affairs. Um, so, essentially, this status is something that is almost intrinsic to one's person. Uh, it's difficult to change, and uh, on that basis, you can't be discriminated on, on it. Mm. Yeah. And something that, that uh, really is a, is a massive hurdle for a lot of people who find themselves here as asylum seekers as well, uh, and then you try to make a, an honest living. I mean, it's quite shocking to read some of the stories, uh, like Bruce who, Chaganyuga, who is a waiter, uh, fully qualified lawyer, but he's, pre he's, he's a waiter at the moment. Indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, thank you for bringing up the issue of uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, there's another critical point to say that uh, often these people are fleeing persecution. Uh, the opportunity for them to return to their homes is, is not available. And so they set out to uh, build a life here uh, under the protection of the South African government. And uh, for them to be limited in this way uh, is an affront to their dignity, really. Um, uh, that, that's what we've argued before court. Mm. And, and what do you make? I mean, the, the, there seems to be a push uh, against foreign nationals in South Africa 
at large. You know, what do you make of that? And, and if you could address that, what would you say? I think it's a political scapegoating. It's, uh, we've had a long history in South Africa and globally of um, uh, scapegoating uh, migrants, uh, scapegoating the most vulnerable. And it seems to just be playing out again. Um, it's an issue that uh, must be addressed, I believe, at the highest levels. Um, but this is the type of things that we need to engage with and uh, grapple with as a country. Because ultimately, uh, and as our council put it quite well, we ultimately one community. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of the representation on the council uh, and the representation uh, within, w within your community, if I can put it that way, that's taking on this fight, uh, do you have quite a number of South Africans standing on your side as well? And, and how is that coming across? Indeed we do. Um, there's a lot of allyship, of course. There are people who believe in the Constitution, believe in the rights that are conferred by the Constitution. And uh, we welcome them. Uh, and all those detractors, we also welcome them as well. We like to engage with them. And uh, like I said, we are ultimately one community. And uh, dialogue is the best way to, to come to a consensus. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it, it really is a, a very tough time. And especially being our neighbors, so, you know, South African, uh, and even if you aren't a neighbor, but as the continent, we obviously are trying to foster relations and, and come to a point where we can all live together yes. in harmony. But it does seem like there's a lot of push and pull at the moment in that regard. Look, we ultimately all need each other. Um, South Africa is one of the biggest economic hubs in Africa. Um, they contribute to Africa as much as Africa contributes to them. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's essentially about uh, building a, a sort of a Africa that we would all like to see. Uh, wherein uh, we cooperate uh, and uh, get along in a manner that takes us all forward. Exactly. Let's quickly talk about the outcomes of, um, of the litigation that uh, you, put, you put in front of the current court. Uh, what is obviously the best case scenario and also what then happens if it doesn't go your way? So the Constitutional Court is the, the final um, um, court in the, the, our, the hierarchy of our courts. So uh, this is the end of the road. Uh, we've pushed it as far as we, we, we can push it, and the uh, determination from them is final. Um, we are hoping that the outcome is favorable, um, and if not, uh, we will have to take that and uh, begin other forms of advocacy that uh, continue to advance this issue. Um, but I'd just like to say that uh, the legal profession and South Africa in general would be uh, greatly benefited by the contributions of uh, individuals of a diverse background with different views. Um, even in uh, the sense that uh, they will bring uh, varied experiences that will add to the wealth of uh, our, our industry. Absolutely, indeed. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for coming out, and all the best with uh, that judgment. As you said, it's a couple of months away. We'll be looking uh, forward to that. Uh, that is uh, Muchengeti Huacha. He's the Executive Director of Asylum Seeker, Refugee and Migrant Coalition, uh, in studio this morning to unpack this very important issue.